Good evening, councillors. Can you remain standing, please, for prayers by Rabbi Aaron Goldstein? Thank you. I have to admit that uh, not so many of my own congregation stand for me, so I'm honoured tonight. Thank you so much indeed. <laughs> and uh, I have in my hands here something which I think is quite special for our community. Um, I'm a liberal rabbi. It means I come from one extreme in a sense in this country um, of Judaism. Um, it is uh, a branch of Judaism that accepts biblical criticism, that does not uh, accept that the whole of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible, was given to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai and it is a different way of looking at the world and this is our draft new liturgy it is something which many within Judaism will see as quite radical and many within our own congregation will as well we have already gender neutralised God in the English but Hebrew is a gendered language and so prayers that have been said for generations are being slightly altered within this, this liturgy to include feminine language. For some within our community this is deeply prob problematic. Some look at this, both men and women, and say why do we need to make this change? But for ourselves as liberal rabbis it is very clear. It is something about inclusivity. It is something about saying that all people are welcome within our services, all people welcome within our community. I'm humbled because you represent community just as I represent community. Listening to the conversation and the activities that go on within this community, they're not dissimilar to my own. We have different ways of looking at the world and addressing some of the issues, but each one of us has a role to play. In, all, in amongst all of the very modern and very inclusive readings is one reading which comes from our first liberal rabbi in this country, Israel Mattis, who suggested that truth is not the best loved of virtues and yet it is one of the noblest as it is perhaps the hardest of them all. It needs courage and resolution and strength of will it must be loved for its own sake or it will not be practised. Too often at the moment I hear people speaking and judging each other, judging people who actually speak with good intentions. When we're able to recognise the good intentions of each other, even though we may come from a different perspective, then I think we bring just a little bit of peace and some truth to our business. We say very traditionally, Hine matovu manayim, shevet achim gam yachad, how good it is and how pleasant when sisters and brothers live together in unity. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you please to remain standing for one minute. Um, uh, we had Rita Kilroy passed away um, a week or so ago. And for those who are not sure who she is or was, she was the past mayoress to both Councillor David Yarrow and past mayor Catherine Dan. And um, I'm sure for both of those it's leaving a, a big hole in their hearts. A minute silence, please. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, could we please have apologies for absence? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have apologies from Councillors Bliss, Chapman, Dot, Duncan, Gardner, Bachmana, Seaman Digby, and uh, possibly Councillor Deville, who is going to be late. Thank you very much. Do we have any others? No? Okie coke. Um, we now go on to the minutes of the last meeting um, of the 5th of July. Is it all agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest, please? No? No declarations? Thank you very much. Uh, we now come on to the Mayor's announcements. Um, it seems to be a, a common thing at the moment where I seem to be handing out bad or sad news. You know, see, we've had, I've mentioned about Rita, but um, last weekend, Jess Shepherd, who's a, a young girl um, from Harefield, who Councillor Hensley knows very well uh, from his time as being Mayor, um, she passed away on Saturday of uh, a neuroblastoma, which is childhood cancer. Um, I don't know if any of you saw any of the photographs of her, but um, sad news. Um, um, heart goes out to her. Um, late July and August is always a relatively quiet month for the Mayor, whereas sort of like building up to the summer holidays, we're getting four or five events a day. During July, late July, August, we're down to about four or five events a week. However, that hasn't stopped some of the events. Um, this past month and a half, we've been celebrating 100 years, not just of the RAF, but also the peace, the end of the Great War. Um, but also something that's been hidden quite a lot is the, the Polish independence. Knowing how many uh, Polish people, residents that we do have in Hillingdon, um, it, it's quite a big eye-opener how much it still means to them today. But also we had the Polish Air Force. They actually started at near enough the same time as the RAF. And from 1917, they were helping each other in tactical flying. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to meet five centurions in the, my role as mayor so far. So, a you know, hundred seems to be a, a, a nice round figure. Late August, um, we had six personnel from RAF Northolt who came to the aid of one of my charities, the Peter Pan and Wendy Ward. Uh, Peter Pan and Wendy had uh, a, a conservatory that needed demolishing and they had a quote of £12,000 to have it demolished. These six personnel from, I can't say guys, because we had both men and women, they came round and it was demolished within five hours, and it was left in a much tidier state than when they found it. And cost was a few pizzas. Uh, I've also been fortunate enough to open a couple of skate parks um, in, the, in Hillingdon, one in Uxbridge and the other one in South Islip. And yes, the rumours are true. It did take me back to my childhood. Yes, I did have a skateboard back in the 1970s. And I think I was possibly the only one who had one. And finally, quiz night. A big thank you to everybody who came along last night. Um, also to uh, our in-house catering. The food was fantastic. And... Uh, it was well done, and hopefully I'll see some more of you on the 7th of November, which is our next quiz night. Thank you.
Oh, we now go on to the public questions. We have 5.1, which is from uh, uh, Anita MacDonald. But I, any sign of her? No. Nope. Um, Mr. B Mr. Bianco. Councillor Bianca, to the likes of you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I will, uh, in, in the absence, uh, and I've just done a particularly fulsome answer, which I know she would have enjoyed, being a former councillor here herself, um, but I will give her a written answer. Thank you very much, Councillor Bianco. Um, 5.2, question from Mr. Mohammed Islam. Mr. Mayor. Following the offensive remarks made by Boris Johnson concerning the wearing of the burqa hijab, we asked the London Council to represent the deep concern of the Muslim population in the Bara. When the Council therefore publicly condemned Boris Johnson for his ignorant, insulting, unacceptable language toward Muslim women in particular and the Muslim community in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Puddyford. Thank you, Mr Mayor. May I begin by thanking Mr Islam for raising this as a question, and for the to the Labour Group also my thanks for not raising this as a motion, thus allowing me the necessary time to deal with this issue properly. The question relates to an article written by Boris Johnson and published in the Daily Telegraph on the 6th of August, in which, amongst other things, he made reference to comments made in 2006 by the then leader of the Commons, Jack Straw, saying, if a constituent came to my MP's surgery with a face obscured, I should feel fully entitled, like Jack Straw, to ask her to remove it so that I could talk to her properly. In 2006, Jack Straw had said that he made it clear to women wearing the knee hab at constituency surgeries that he would prefer them to remove the facial garment because face-to-face -face conversations are of greater value. He wanted them to say that no one had refused his request. He insisted that he did not want to be prescriptive of Muslim women's dress, but said that the increasing trend towards facial features was bound to make better relations between the two communities more difficult. At the time, Hazel Blears, the chairman of the Labour Party, gave Mr Straw her backing, saying that his request to his constituents was perfectly proper. Downing Street, at the time, said he was expressing a personal opinion. For the point of doubt, we need at this point to clarify the different types of clothing worn by Muslim women. Jack Straw was referring to the niehab, which is a full veil, leaving the eyes clear. A hijab is a headscarf, and the burqa is one piece garment covering the face and the body, often leaving just the mesh screen to see through. I mention this because the question refers to comments made by Mr Johnson about the burqa and the hijab, and there is no reference at all in the article to the hijab. This clarification is important so I will proceed on the basis that whoever drafted the question had not read the article or had not read it properly and meant to say burqa and niqab. Again, if you had read the article, you would have noted that far from insulting the Muslim community as stated in the question, the article really does do the reverse. The article referred to a recent visit to Denmark made by Mr Johnson in which he enthusiastically praised the free way of life enjoyed by the Danes, saying if you want to visit the country that seemed on the face of it to embody the principles of John Stuart Mill, the British philosopher, that you, you should be able to do what you want, provided you do no harm to others, I would advise you to go and head for wonderful, wonderful Copenhagen. He goes on to say, so I was a bit surprised to see that on the 1st of August, the Danes joined several other European countries, France, Germany, Austria and Belgium, in imposing a ban on the kneecap and the burqa those Muslim items of headgear that obscure the female face. I am against the total ban because it is in inevitably construed, rightly or wrongly, as being intended to make some point about Islam. If you go for a total ban, you play into the hands of those who want to politicise and dramatise the so-called clash of the civilisations, and you fan the flames of grievance. If Danish women really want to cover their faces, then it seems a bit extreme to stop them under all circumstances I do not suggest we follow suit. The total ban is not the answer. So what are the remarks that have been deemed to be offensive by some people? They are, and this is what he said, if you tell me that the burqa is oppressive, then I'm with you. If you say it's weird and bullying to expect women to cover their faces, then I totally agree. 
I would add that I can find no scriptural authority for this practice in the Quran. I would go further to say that it is absolutely ridiculous that people should choose to go around looking like letterboxes and I thoroughly dislike any attempt by any invariably male government to encourage such de demonstrations of so-called modesty. And, after agreeing with Drax Straw's view on attending, those attending MP surgeries being asked to remove the kneecap, he said, if a female student turned up at school or a university lecture looking like a bank robber, then ditto. He goes on to say, all this seems sensible to me, but such restrictions are not quite the same as telling a free-born adult woman what she may or may not wear in a public place when she is simply minding her own business. Council will be aware that there have been numerous cases across this country, Europe and indeed the rest of the world, of people, normally men, dressing in burqas or kneecaps, robbing banks and jewellers. Indeed, only this week, the gang carried, carried out ten such raids on jewellers in Greater Manchester were jailed. And it was a bank robbery in France in 2010 with two men dressed in burqas that was used as an example of why the French government were imposing bans on the burqa. Now we are very fortunate to live in a country that allows freedom of speech and also freedom to agree or disagree with comments made by politicians, particularly MPs. So what constitutes unacceptable language? At the local level, we have John McDonnell, who over the years has made many comments that have caused offence to various people. Since June, he's been embroiled in the anti-Semitism row that has embraced the Labour Party, which has seen such examples of free speech as Chaka Umuna stating that Labour is institutionally racist and should call off the dogs to stop MPs being driven out by left-wingers in their constituencies. This led to the Labour Party chairman saying calling, off the, any, calling anybody a dog is absolutely outrageous in the extreme, and Chaka of all people should know that. Labour Party member and former chairman of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, Trevor Phillips, claimed that Labour is led by anti-Semites and racists, saying they basically want to eliminate anybody who disagrees with them. Jeremy Corbyn's office responded by saying that Mr Phillips' comments were wrong and offensive. John McDonnell's support for the IRA, saying such things as it was bombs and bullets and the sacrifice made by the likes of Bobby Sands that brought Britain to the negotiating table, may seem a strange thing for a British politician to say and was undoubtedly upsetting for the families who lost loved ones in IRA bomb attacks. Stating that he would go back and assassinate Margaret Thatcher in his comments about lynching Tory Minister Esther McVeigh, who he referred to as a stain on humanity, are other examples of what many people found offensive, or as Mr Islam described in the question table tonight, as ignorant, insulting and unacceptable. Now to be fair to John, he has admitted that he has, in his own words, sometimes gone too far in the criticism of opponents, but insisted that it was better to be honest about his views, saying, at times, in Parliament in particular, it means using strong language, but actually, if it reflects your honest views, I think it's better to be honest than it is to be deceptive. Now, Mr Islam, it really would be disingenuous, given the record of John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn, not to allow Boris Johnson the same rights to express his honest opinions. I referred earlier to our rights of free speech and your presence here tonight, Mr Islam, putting forward certain views and opinions demonstrates the freedom that we do value in this country. However, if we are to retain this freedom, it must be available to everybody, even those whose views may differ from your own. Clearly, we will not always agree with the views and opinions expressed by others, but I will end with a phrase originally attributed to Voltaire, but now generally thought to be the words of the English author Evelyn Beatrice Hall, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Thank you very much, Councillor Puddyford. Now on to agenda item number six, which of... Sorry, 5.3, sorry. And, uh, it's a question from Mr Chris Walters, who I gather is not here. Uh, so, Councillor Bowes, please. Mr Mayor, like my other Cabinet colleague, I will ensure that a written response is provided in the time frame set by the Constitution. Thank you very much, Councillor Bowes. Now we go on to the report of the uh, Head of Democratic Services. And it's Councillor Puddyford, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. There are two parts of this report, and I will move the recommendations in each part individually. The first recommendation is that Council note the use of urgency provisions in decision-making between the 22nd of June and the 21st of August. As detailed in the Council agenda, I move the recommendation. 
And seconder, Councillor Simmons. Uh, Mr Mayor, I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you very much. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Councillor Puddyford. Mr Mayor, the second part of this report refers to the review of the electoral arrangements for this borough being coordinated by the Local Government Boundary Commission. The Commission have recommended that with effect from May 2022, the council size will be 53 members. They are now conducting a 10-week public consultation inviting submissions from interested parties within the borough regarding the structure of the electoral wards, covering such detail as size and number of wards, ward names, ward boundaries and the number of councillors to represent each ward. The council will be making a submission and as the deadline for that falls before the next council meeting, it is proposed that the Head of Democratic Services, in consultation with myself, submit this council's recommendation. I move the recommendation as shown on the order paper. Second to Councillor Simmons. Mr Mayor, I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councillor Curley. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I would like to uh, move the amendment as uh, on the uh, order paper that would include the Leader of the Opposition in that uh, consultation with, uh, or that meeting with uh, the Head of Democratic Services. Um, I think the amendment speaks for itself. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr Mayor. Almost, Miss Councillor Gerling. Uh, do we have a seconder for that, please? Uh, Councillor Eddington. Thank you very much. Do, now, obviously, we're speaking on the amendment. Do we have any other speakers on this? Uh, Councillor Puddyford. Um, if uh, the Leader of the Opposition would like to um, his ideas considered, he should put them forward to the Head of Democratic Services and myself, and we will consider them. Any other speakers? No? Okay. Yeah, he did indeed. Councillor Edgington. Working. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, yes, I think it's worthwhile explaining why the Labour group believes that it should be a consideration by both leaders of the two political groups. It's likely to hold greater weight with the Boundary Commission, in my opinion, and um, it is just makes a lot more sense for there to be some sort of uh, political consensus, as it is meant to be um, an independent review. So that, that's our proposal. Um, and I ask um, everybody to support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Curling? Okay, so just to remind you, we're voting on the amendment first. Uh, all those in favour, please show. And against? The amendment fall falls. Uh, we're now back on to the uh, original motion, and uh, is uh, Councillor Simmons, I think it was, who seconded it. Councillor Puddyford. No, I've nothing else to say, Mr. Mayor. We can go to the vote on it. Yeah. All those in favour? You, you, you only just got that one in, guys. Only just. Recorded vote it is. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just to remind members and members of the public who may be watching, a uh, recorded vote ask each member individually which way they vote for, against or abstain. And I'll do it in alphabetical order. You are voting for the recommendation as shown in the middle of page two um, on item six, little two. Uh, Councillor Ahmad Walana. Councillor Allen. Okay. Councillor Arnold, Four. Councillor Barnes, Four. Councillor Bianco, Four. Councillor Birra, Councillor Bridges, Four. Councillor Brightman, Four. Councillor Burrows, Four. Councillor Chamdal, Four. Councillor Chubidar, Four. Councillor Cooper, Four. Councillor Cawthorn, Four. Councillor Curling, okay. Councillor Dennis, Four. Councillor Dillon's not here yet, Councillor Dillon, okay. Councillor Edwards, Councillor Edgington, okay. Councillor Farley, okay. 
Councillor Flynn, Councillor Fife, Councillor Goddard, Councillor Graham, Councillor Hagger, Councillor Hensley, Councillor Higgins, Councillor Hurringy, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Kaufman, Councillor Lavery, Councillor Lewis, Councillor Makwana, Councillor Markham, Councillor Mathers, Councillor Melvin, Councillor Milani, Councillor D. Mills, Councillor R. Mills, Councillor Money, Councillor Morse, Councillor Nelson, Councillor O'Brien, Councillor Oswell, Councillor Palmer, Councillor Prince, Councillor Puddyfoot, Councillor Radia, Councillor Riley, Councillor Rodriguez, Councillor Sansapuri, Councillor Simmons, Councillor Singh, Councillor Stead, Councillor Sweeting, Councillor Tuckwell, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That is lost by uh, 41 votes to 16. Thank you very much. So the motion is, oh, the report is carried. Thank you. <laughs> you did. <laughs> well, we now go on to item number seven, which is the local development scheme. And uh, Councillor Burrows, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, the local development scheme came before Cabinet in July um, this year and we resolved obviously to put this to Council for adoption. And the recommendation is that we adopt the local development scheme with effect from tomorrow, as you can see on the recommendation there. The actual LDS sets out our direction and the dates, the specific dates that we have to meet to get our local plans through. Currently, the one that we have was published in January 2016 and is considered to be out of date at the moment under the provisions of the Plan and Compulsory Purchase Act. Hence why we have this before us this evening. There's nothing contentious in this, Mr Mayor, and as you know, our local development plans rely on this and without moving this through Council this evening, they could fail when it comes to examination. So this is important documentation for us and I so move the recommendation that Council adopt this as of this evening. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Burrows. And do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Douglas Mills. Mr Mayor, I formally second and reserve my right. Thank you very much, Councillor Douglas Mills. Do we have any speakers? Councillor Curling. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this, this is something that uh, we will not be supporting, we won't be voting against, but we will be abstaining on this because whilst we recognise that there are some very important things that need to get through, um, we also recognise that there are some um, issues in there that could cause some of our residents, particularly in the south of the borough, uh, quite a bit of uh, angst and we, we don't believe there's been sufficient consultation with the residents in that part of the borough. So uh, whilst we won't be holding this up, we, uh, uh, we, won't be, we will be abstaining. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Curling. Do we have any other speakers? No. Councillor Mills? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, as I expected, Hillenden Labour Group is uh, failing to take action on something which is very important to the future of this borough, and that is determining what kind of borough we want going forward and how we make the most of the land and best uses therefrom. And I just want, Mr Mayor, Council to understand that what we're talking about is how we actually achieve an increase in the housing stock. And who is it, Mr Mayor, who is always on moaning and groaning that we wicked Conservatives never do enough to provide enough housing for, for the people? It is, of course, the Labour Party. And that here they are, uh, refusing to participate in and support the very plan that will actually create additional housing units mainly on land that has lain empty for many, many years down along that West Drayton Hayes uh, corridor. And indeed, um, the uh, MP for Hayes and Harlington uh, appeared at a recent inquiry and said Hillenden Council is dumping housing in the south of the borough. And I think, Mr Mayor, we just need to remember that absolute dilemma that they've got themselves in. They want to attack us 
for not providing housing and when we do provide housing on land that has been empty in some cases for 20 years they want to attack us. Well I think the residents of Hillingdon deserve a lot better than that. But they have form, they have form Mr Mayor. Now I can understand there are issues and responsibilities that flow from this in terms of the infrastructure, ones that we're facing up to. And I just Mr Mayor again because there's so many new councillors on their side and our side. Our side have had the advantage of, of reading our manifesto, their side probably haven't and probably don't know the history. Councillor Curling, when asked a few years ago about where do we put the new primary school in the Hayes area, when we were specifically asked, and do you know what the answer was after a month or so? Well, I'm going to give you it here. That was the Hillenden Labour Party <laughs> answer. And tonight, it's a repeat. That is exactly what they are doing again, Mr Mayor. A blank piece of paper pretending it will go away. Mr Mayor, they are inadequate and they are inferior. And the one thing they're not is in control, because yeah. we are. Councillor Bowes. No? <laughs> uh, is that all those in favour? Abstained? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That's passed. Thank you. We now go on to agenda item eight, and it's uh, a question from Councillor Makwana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Would the Cabinet Member for Social Services, Housing, Health and Wellbeing please provide an update on the proposals from the Healthy London Partnership to reduce the number of health-based places of safety in North West London. Thank you. Councillor Cawthorn. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor McCarner, for tabling the question. I'm most grateful to you for doing so because it gives me an opportunity to say something about this issue which is giving concern uh, among health and social care partners in this borough and beyond. And I suppose I should start by explaining uh, what one of these uh, health-based places of safety actually is. These are places where people detained and transported under Section 136 of the 1983 Mental Health Act can be looked after safely whilst an assessment is carried out by a psychiatrist and what's known as an approved mental health professional. This applies when someone is considered by the police to have a mental health disorder and may potentially cause harm to themselves or others. And in Hillingdon, we play host to one of these Section 136 suites ourselves at Riverside at Hillingdon Hospital. Now, changes stemming from the Police and Crime Act 2017 include limits to the circumstances in which police stations can be used as places of safety and a reduction in the previous maximum detention periods from 72 hours to 24 hours. Now, I think there is certainly a case for change given the increased number of people being managed in this way and the significant strain placed upon police and health and social care services. Back in 2014-15, an external services scrutiny report looked in detail at the challenges and pressures across the partnership locally in delivering these services. However, in spite of this, the Healthy London Partnership, which is a collaboration which includes the NHS, London Councils, the GLA and the Office of the Mayor of London, are coming forward with proposals which include a reduction in the number of these Section 136 suites across North West London from 8 to 3 by 2020. Now, we and our local health partners are monitoring this very closely, as the proposed Section 136 programme has never been properly consulted upon or agreed across the North West London boroughs. We are concerned because boroughs like Hillingdon, which, as I say, play host to one of these suites would potentially have to provide additional mental health practitioners and pick up the additional aftercare social costs for people who are not usually resident in our borough. Officers have been given a very clear steer that whilst we are naturally supportive of improving services for vulnerable people, we won't be agreeing to any changes until the full implications for us in Hoondon are known and understood and any concerns have been properly addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cawthorn. Uh, Councillor uh, McCarner, have you a, a, a supplement, please? 
No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tuckwell, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, can the Cabinet Member for Finance, Property and Business Services confirm to me how the Council has fared in respect of the recent awards of green flags? Councillor Tuckwell. May I thank you for your question on one of my favourite subjects? <laughs> Now, knowing, knowing that you and quite a, few, uh, quite a number of our, our council colleagues here tonight uh, are new to the uh, chamber uh, and therefore new to this subject, I thought I'd give a more fulsome answer this year perhaps than in previous years. Uh, the London Borough of Hillingdon has a long history of gaining green flags uh, for its parks and open spaces. And what you and others may not know is that we've been involved with this scheme since its inset in 2005. The scheme itself is run by the Keep Britain Tidy campaign on behalf of the DHCLG, in other words, the Department of Health, Communities and Local Government. In Hillingdon, as I said, we have, a long, we have long seen this scheme as complementary to Britain in Bloom, as it recognises local and individual green spaces, as well as the local residents who take part in the schemes themselves, and of course, our dedicated green spaces team who work so hard to ensure these spaces are put into and remain in good condition. The Green Flag Awards are judged annually, so it is not a case that once a green flag is obtained it will be kept, but rather that every year all our green flag locations are revisited and rejudged, if there is such a word, to determine whether they should retain their status or not. I am pleased to report, Mr Mayor and Councillor Tuckwell, that this year the number of green flag sites within the borough has risen to 50. This, this is a record. It is 10 more than our nearest rival, Nottingham, who have 40, good maths, and 23 more than our nearest London uh, uh, rival as well. Can't remember who they are, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it is a continuing step forward for Hillingdon and there is no doubt that our residents greatly value our open spaces and I'm pleased to say that this year we have added East Cope Memorial Gardens and Connaught Recreation Ground to the long list of existing sites and here is the, the fine map uh, showing, showing the spread of uh, 50 uh, green spaces. And the two highlighted here, uh, number 7 and number 11, are the new ones. Uh, you can see uh, the spread across the borough. Uh, in the years ahead, of course, I, have, uh, no, I see no reason why this number shouldn't increase still further, as we have many more parks and open spaces uh, for which we can apply, and I'm looking at the Deputy Chief Executive when I say this. Turning to this fine map, you can see the new parks, as I mentioned, and also the retained parks. And you will see that there are more uh, green space, green flag uh, parks in the south of the borough than there are in the north. And if you care to count them, you'll find that that is true. And if you'd like a copy of this map, I can make one available to you. We're deprived. You are, we are deprived in the north. Uh, it's a fine result, and one we can continue to build on in the future and one which our residents can justly be proud, possibly only due to the sound financial management existing here in Hillingdon, which allows us both to put our residents first and maintain a green and pleasant environment for all our residents to enjoy. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bianco. Councillor Tuffwell, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Mr Mayor. I have no supplementary question. Thank you very much. We now go on to ice, agenda item 9, motions. Uh, 9.1, Councillor Nelson, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. The significance of Black History Month is both a celebration and remembrance of those members of the black community who have contributed to the history and development of the United Kingdom. 
The story of individual and people of African origin classified as black and their contribution to the development and growth of civilization from when time began to present. And in the specific case of Britain, our Black History Month UK are our story as chronicle and retold of our sentimental achievements and contribution to social, political, cultural development as well in the United Kingdom. These achievements and contributions of Africans, both at home and abroad, must no longer be hidden under the bullish from all our children, black or white, growing up in the present and post-Brexit UK. Black History Month was refashioned to give meaning and teeth to the Race Relation and Equality Act in the UK. It is a recognition of the contribution of people of African descent to the value system and way of life of British society that will make black lives matter. In addition to the 30th anniversary of Black History Month, it is worthy of a special mention, the 70th anniversary of the arrival of the SS Empire Windrush in 1948, bringing 492 passengers from the Caribbean. Significantly, many of the 492 passengers were former military personnel. The majority of those who paid 28 pounds, 10 shillings fare to travel to Britain were therefore war veterans. They belonged to a distinguished cohort of black military personnel contributing to the country's war effort. Black History Month acknowledged these signature moments in the history of the UK. For the next 30 years, it is our hope that young historians and activists will accept the baton that is being passed on to challenge the rest of British society every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week and every month must be made an October month of black history. Justice imposed on people who have and were prepared to lay down their lives in defense of Britain. Our original goal was to first create an enabling cultural space in the UK to make Black History Season a celebration of the magnificence of cultural diversity and the enriching values in peaceful coexistence. To the African mind, to achieve harmony, both black and white, key of the organ in tune. Over the last several months, who would have imagined that the whole issue of Binrush scandal would become a major news story? or foreseen the political fallout as British citizens of Caribbean heritage, many of whom have spent most of their lives in the UK, lost their rights, homes, livelihood, and even their life as a result of the Home Office hostile environment policy, a policy which saw Britain's citizens treated as illegal immigrants facing deportation or being refused entry into Britain, coming back from holiday. We need to remember many aspects of British, British society today and would be unrecognizable without the contribution which immigration and integration have made to our society over the generation. From the NHS to the monarch, our language, literature, enterprise, public life, fashion, music, politics, science, culture, and even our humor. In this month, in this month's Helen and People, there is a two-page spread celebrating the culture, art, and festivals. There is nothing in this program which celebrates black history in this most multicultural of boroughs. So I am calling on this council to reconsider reintroducing Black History Month back onto the council timetable of events for our community, our people, young and old, living in this borough, and not to tag it onto People History Month. Is this fall on deaf ears and an affirmation of the continent of the status quo, then Hilladon will continue to be regarded as lip service paying borough to the idea of inclusivity for those in the borough who come from different cultural backgrounds and who history is to be submerged. The government conceded with about as much grace as they could muster that this policy was not just fundamentally flawed but Councilor wrong. Nelson. We wait the answer from Thank the leader you, of the Councilor council. Nelson.
Do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I'm proud to support Black History Month, and I want to pay tribute to everyone who has, over the last 30 years, has helped to support this opportunity to celebrate the extraordinary contribution that our African and African-Caribbean communities make to the United Kingdom. Today, in every walk of life, from business to politics, sport to culture, there are African and African-Caribbean men and women whose achievements are not just making our country better, place, but inspiring others to follow in their footsteps to even greater success. So as we mark the 30th anniversary of Black History Month, it's right to look back with pride on the progress that has been made in taking on racism and discrimination. That's a quote from Theresa May, 2018. Hillingdon, with its diversity, should embrace events and months like this rather than generalise and summarise them into ex extinction. I've spoken to our officers recently and they've been unable to inform me how we have done anything to publicise Black History Month into People's Month. In fact, they were actually dubious as to there were only two events within the last four years that they were able to tell me about that celebrated people's history. That's something that you may want to take up. I would urge this council to take leadership, embrace and celebrate, set a standard as we, have a, as, we as a borough value all our residents. In the same way we celebrate Manor Farm history, we should celebrate Black History Month. Let's make a change and reestate Black History Month. I support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Uh, Councillor Sweeting. Thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> I speak in support of the motion. As the Prime Minister went on to say in her Downing Street speech in support of Black History Month, but I'm also clear just how far we have to go, not just in rooting out hatred and prejudice from our society, but in tackling injustices that still hold back too many people in our country today. That is why I've published in the first results of the work which I commissioned within months of becoming Prime Minister, an unprecedented audit of public services to reveal racial disparities right across government. It exposes some uncomfortable truths about the injustices that still exist in our society today, from health and education to welfare and the criminal justice system. She went on to say, as Prime Minister, I make no apology for exposing these truths. I believe it is my duty to shine a light on these injustices, and I want to lead a nation effort to address them so that Britain can truly become a country that works for everyone. This is my pledge for Black History Month, and I hope you will all work with me to make it a reality. The Prime Minister is not alone in urging all of us to work in support of the aims of Black History Month. All other Conservative councils in London also continue to support Black History Month, and the many activities each of these councils delivers is there for all of us to see. It is only this Conservative Council which has not supported the Prime Minister and failed to heed her call to arms. Please, therefore, let Hillingdon also show its commitment to the worthy aims that Black History Month seeks to deliver by bringing Black History Month back to Hillingdon. Please support the motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Sweeting. Councillor Allen, please. Mr Mayor, I'm astounded at the silence across the floor. Many years ago, as a child, I witnessed the changes in the community I lived. Out of the blue, we had children from another country join us at school. And through them and their parents, I learned a lot. My life was enriched by what I learned. Many of the parents had come here because we had a shortage of workers, and their skills were vital to lift this country out of the poverty it was in at the time. Sadly, some did not welcome them, but they persevered, settled and became part of the community. From doctors, nurses, teachers, mechanics, road builders, filling out our factories to keep Britain growing and growing. And many of their children have succeeded where their parents did not. Still full of dreams 
and hope for the future and many of them we've been told are up there doing what you know <laughs> nobody ever expected but they got there in and around 1976 Black History Month uh, Black History Month came about and we all celebrated I can't think of any borough that didn't go out and celebrate oh can I please turn a, a smirking light off across the floor then out of the blue two years ago this council decided no we're not going to have uh, history we can sign that to history the saying history is our future treat it kind celebrate it and it won't come back to haunt you should never be more true and today we, we hear about Windrush settled residents of our community treated very badly tonight members we have a chance to say let's put that behind us let's start valuing those who came to, came to our assistance uh, Mr Mayor I'm asking that this council accepts this motion and moves forward to restore Black History Month where it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Can you kindly switch your microphone? Councillor Lewis, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. May I, may I through you, thank uh, Councillor Nelson for asking me to reconsider celebrating Black History Month in Hillingdon. I do actually think uh, this should have been a question to me rather than a motion as once I've made the decision in my cabinet role I'm actually not sure what the benefits there are in actually debating my decision but then nevertheless uh, let me lay out some background Black History Month was celebrated in our libraries until 2007 in 2008 the emphasis was changed and moved to celebrating the range of diverse community groups and cultures across the borough this year, the Prime Minister said that the 30th anniversary of, the, of Black History Month is marked, it is right to mark and look back with pride at the progress that's been made in taking on racism and discrimination. She went on to talk about how far we have to go, not just in rooting out hatred and prejudice from our society, but in tackling injustices that still hold back far too many people in our country today. Personally, I believe social cohesion is achieved through integration and opening up opportunities for all, and that we must root out discrimination, whether it is discrimination that relates to the colour of someone's skin, their sexual orientation, or indeed of particular relevance to today's Labour Party and leadership, their religious beliefs. Discrimination is, as I'm sure Councillor Nelson will agree, totally abhorrent and has no place in our society. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that, he also said, we may all have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Here in Hillingdon, our relationship with overseas nations ranges from, from wide military connections with the United States, a great connection with the Canadian military through John Cecil Kinrose, a Canadian uh, recipient of the, George, uh, of, the, of the VC, who was born in Harefield, as well as I'm sure you're aware, a very large Polish community in the borough. We're inordinately proud of our diverse communities, which I'm delighted to say have integrated incredibly well to form a strong, cohesive society, all united under the Hillingdon flag. So I do hope that you'll understand when I say I believe it would be impossible to separate his history events for all of our individual communities. And in some ways, it could in fact act as a barrier to integration. Our commemoration this year will be the centenary of the end of the First World War, when the British Army, made up of soldiers from across the Commonwealth, fought in what was hoped was to be the war to end all wars. Sadly, as we all know, far too well it wasn't. But during the First World War, more than 61,000 Australians, 56,000 Canadians... Thank you very much, Councillor Lewis. Thank you. Okay. I do hope you understand my reason for not selecting and commemorating just the black community's con contribution to Hillingdon, but instead I would strongly... Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Sansapori. Thank you, Mr Mayor. 
as of the last year more than 45% of the hillingdon population belong to bame community and it set to increase black history month has been celebrated for over 3 decades in london and the wider community in the uk generally and the key to key to that celebrating is diversity black culture everything from notting hill carnival to entertainment to academia to sports it is a chance to recognize the contribution that black community has made to this country black history month is a time when people of african background can come together in memory of their rich past a past that has been largely hidden from them it is a time when they they are given opportunity to learn about their vibrant culture to discuss and educated about many contribution and accomplishment of their community which throughout the history have been taken for granted but not celebrated black, black history month is a period when the younger generation can take time to sit and listen to their elders share heartfelt moments of their experience and struggle when they were young it is a time when all can cry together over those soul that died during, during the passage to this country on slave ship it is a time when we can learn about the great back achievement that that got ignored it is a time when we can learn about the great great heroes of civil rights movement here and abroad it is an opportunity to correct many of many of the misrepresentation misunderstanding and fallacies of black culture still prevalent today black history month promotes the opportunity for open dialogue and personal interaction between many culture these conversation and interactions can lead to better understanding and appreciation for what experience and daily dilemma each of us go through as we all make try to contribution to our families and larger community society mr mayor if we celebrate black history month it doesn't is does not mean that we are ignoring other community and other minority groups irrespective of political affiliations every year the mayor of london has celebrated baisakhi the sikh new year and diwali with great pomp and show the british army regularly organizes function to celebrate the contribution made by indian soldier in both world war i fail to understand this council feel great pride to celebrate manner form history weekend on this weekend which is fair enough which is very good in rice leaf but refusing to reintroduce black history month it is obvious that both both decisions are based on political consideration mr mayor i support this motion thank you do we have any other speakers no councillor nelson please thank you mr mayor you said the question the question was what are the benefits the benefits are we should celebrate all communities all are valued by strong by strong ones we can embrace more education and history and we can lead and which will lead to greater knowledge and cohesion within our schools within our community you said things are done in library I haven't seen anything in library. I haven't seen anything in school. What is being done for our residents within this borough to know that this borough cares about the community? What is being done? Nothing. So, Councillor Nelson, through the mayor, my please. My apologies. Uh, please through the mayor, please. I think um, you said you also raised the issue about a um, uh, quote by Martin Luther King, by Martin Luther King, and injustice. Show justice to our community. Show our community that you are embracing, you are welcoming the whole culture and the diversity that is in this community. Show it by reinstating Black History Month on the agenda. That's all we're asking. Reinstating in whatever way you need to do it. Just reinstate that. Don't ignore it. And the thing that within our community is that they don't care about us. They don't care anything about us because if they do, then they would be celebrating Black History with us. and they're not so i'm asking uh, 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 mr mayor that this council reconsider reintroducing black history month into the borough thank you thank you very much councillor nelson please switch your mic off please thank you 
Okay, we now go to the vote, please. Um, all those in favour of the motion, please show. And against? That, that motion fails. We now go on to motion 9.2. Councillor Curling, please. Thank you, Mr Mayor. This motion is not driven by party politics, but rather one um, that is driven by an injustice. And that is recognised across party lines. The injustice is that women born in the 1950s who worked through most of their adult life with the prospect of receiving their state pension at the age of 60, who now have the state pension age extended to 66 with no transitional relief. As stated in the motion, it is accepted that men and women should receive their state pension at the same age, but the issue is one of transitional arrangements. After all, for the majority of uh, the 50s women have contributed to their pension and planned for their finances and family life around their retirement age of being 60. The Pensions Act of 1995 provided for the state pension for women to increase from 60 to 65 over the period of April 2010 to April 2020. The Pensions Act 2011 accelerated the latter part of this uh, timetable so that women's state pension age now reaches 65 in November of this year. In 2011, Ian Duncan Smith made a commitment to look at transitional provisions to help women who have been hit hardest by the changes to the state pension age but this commitment has never been followed through. The lack of proper arrangements to allow 50s women a smooth transition to the new state pension age is causing many women in this age group considerable hardship, which also has knock-on effects for their families and their general family life. It's not just a financial hardship in many cases, but one that impacts on a variety of quality of life and family life issues. There must be many women, probably thousands in this borough, who fall into this age group, uh, maybe even one or two in this chamber, although I appreciate, Mr Mayor, that's hard to believe because everyone looks so youthful. <laughs> All of the women in this age group will be affected. Some will be harder hit than others, but it is certainly something that has a very far and wide-reaching effect. This is why we believe that the Cabinet should receive a report into how this is impacting on the lives of our residents and then use that information to lobby government on their behalf. As I said earlier, this motion is driven by an injustice, and you've heard this quote before, but uh, in the words of Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice <laughs> everywhere. Councils of all political persuasions across the country have agreed similar motions to this in order to represent their residents and lobby government for decent transitional arrangements. As this council prides itself on putting residents first, I'm hoping that this will be the case in Hillingdon and that all members across party lines feel that they can support this motion. Mr Mayor, I so move. Thank you very much, Councillor Curling. Do we have a seconder, please? Councillor Prince. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Women born in the 50s here in the UK have had a life so far that many women before them did not. They have seen rapid change in social policy and attitudes, from the right to choose and control their own means of reproduction to holding more positions in public office than ever before. And my generation of young women have stood on the shoulders and we hope to continue to deliver a fair and just world for all women, no matter their age, identity, religion or race. And one way that my generation can go on to deliver such a world is to address the problems of today, even if it does not affect us personally. Nearly 12,000 women in Hillingdon who were born in the 1950s have been affected by the 2011 changes to the state pension age. I have been inspired at the thousands and thousands of women up and down this country who have run one of the most visible and boldest campaigns that I personally have seen. But this Conservative government has knocked them back, sat on their hands and decided they would rather do nothing at all in the hope that it will go away. This isn't really about the state pension age. It's about many women born in the 50s who did not receive appropriate notice of these changes, something that the Conservative government accepts but is unwilling to do anything about. And now they face years of hardship, or if they were to take the pension minister's advice, they can go and do an apprenticeship instead, an insult to those 50s born women who have spent their lives contributing towards this economy. They deserve better, and the government must be better. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Prince. Councillor Douglas Mills. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, this is a very important issue, but this is not the chamber in which it should be debated. Um, and we want to make it absolutely clear to, to the uh, Hillenden Labour Group that motions where they want to turn it into a junior uh, student union debating society or pretend to be parliamentarians when they're not will not be uh, put forward. And how glaring tonight, Mr Mayor, that when they had the chance to talk about Hillenden issues under the local development plan, the things that actually affect our residents across the whole of the borough, they were silent. And yet, here they are, trying to use this chamber to have a go and raise issues which clearly are of a national importance and need to be debated. And my advice uh, to, to them is, if they are that strong about this issue, they should talk to their MPs and get their MPs to raise it in the proper place, which is the House of Commons. Yeah. Now, we want to give them fair notice, not only on this motion, but on future motions, that if they try this tactic again, Mr Mayor, it's a very strong likelihood that someone on our side will invoke Standing Order 1411 and bring debate to a close and to a vote straight away, uh, if it provides subject, of course, to the usual caveats of you feeling it right and proper. But what we would like to hear them debate are the issues that affect Hillenden residents. So let's get you up on your feet next time and let you discuss the success of our green flag parks. Let's hear you talk about council tax being not risen in this borough for so many years, the libraries being refurbished, the school places being provided, the roads being resurfaced, all the things which thankfully thousands and thousands of residents on May the 3rd took a look at what we did and took a look at you and guess what they decided? Oh, there's more of us. Um, they decided, the, the Mr Mayor, 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 they decided quite clearly that what they want to, this chamber to be about is about putting residents first. That's what we do and that's what we will do. We're not here to discuss national issues unless it is directly related to Hillenden, such as HS2 or third runways, etc, etc. And that's what we will debate and we will not play their childish political games because we don't have to. We're here to look after our residents because that's what 40-odd thousand residents voted for on May the 3rd. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Councillor Allen. I, for one, won't listen to the threats. Tonight, my group has placed two motions before this council, both tell of injustices and both have offered solutions. I am sure there is not one member of this council who does not know someone who has been affected by the cruel changes made to the women's pension rights and the havoc it has wrought, leaving some in dire straits, leaving them with no money to fall back on. These are women, women, who, without thought for themselves, have kept their home going, rain or shine, ensuring everybody's welfare is taken care of, but their own. The only light they had at the end of the tunnel was believing that at 60 years of age they would get a pension in their own right a promise made to them years before, even if their work was never done. This motion has called for action, you know, something Councillor Milks keeps talking about. Now is not the time to say nothing. Now is the time to take action. Tonight, across, the, across this land, there are councils up and down the land putting motions, such as we are, requ requesting this government takes a look and sees what he can do to alleviate the pension crisis. Now is not the time for lip service. It's time for the leader of this council, who I believe is the pensions charity, uh, champion, to use his pen. Please support this motion as a true champion should. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Allen. Councillor Nelson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My speech was going to be very short, but I'm going to pick up on some issues that President Mr. Mr. Mills 
Gray. Councillor Mills. Mr. Mayor, Council, I am speaking in support of this motion. Many millions of women born in the 1950 is living in hardship due to the increase in pension age. Our proposal as a labor group is that we are urging this council to use every avenue and every effort to lobby this government to reconsider the transitional arrangement for many women who, live, who is living in hardship. Many NHS workers are having to return to work to supplement their, their, their NHS pension. As they just cannot live on their NHS pension, our proposal is to return eligibility for pension credit to the state pension age timetable of the 1995 Pension Act, but with the qualifying age which will help single women on low income and will provide a 156 pounds per week to supplement their income. This is not something about student loan. This is not something about women, in, uh, uh, women around. This is about women in our community and our lives. And I know that no matter what party we are from, we all have family, we have friends, we have neighbors, we have work colleagues. All are experiencing hardship of living. And a, and, 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 and a very low pension. Nothing. So there's nothing on a very low pension. And next to nothing. So I urge you to support this motion. And it is about putting our residents first, because this affects all of us. Please support. Thank you very much, Councillor Nelson. Can you switch your mic off as well, please? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Simmons. Well, thank you, Mr Mayor. My mother is one of the people who is affected by these changes, and I can assure you um, she is not alone in having a connection, I'm sure, with members on this side who have been campaigning and working very hard, either with members of Parliament who have a direct opportunity to influence this, or with some of the other campaigns and work that's going on nationally to deal with it. But I think Councillor Mills and other colleagues have been extremely clear that we should not, and I guess a number of Labour members who are absent tonight perhaps have already begun to get a bit bored of the student union debating, we should not mistake talk for action. This is an administration that is proud of the fact that we take action on issues that affect our residents. We do not spend our time debating them for hours and hours in this chamber. We make sure that potholes get filled, that school places are provided, that vulnerable children, elderly residents are looked after, that people who need housing can get that housing, that our libraries are open. And we don't achieve that by spending hours and hours in this chamber filling the place with hot air on issues of a national nature that most properly should be dealt with elsewhere. So on that basis, Mr Mayor, I'll conclude by moving understanding order 1411 that the question be now put. Uh, Mr Mayor, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Councillor Simmons can't yeah. move that the question be now put yeah. because you've just spoken in the debate and it can only be moved by somebody who hasn't spoken in the debate. In which case, Thank I will move that motion. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Mr Mayor, yeah. can I explain? Yeah, uh, I think perhaps for the benefit of, certainly for the new members and the members we don't often have uh, a motion that we now put, uh, normally during a debate on a motion, no other motions are allowed, but there are certain motions that can be moved without notice. Uh, some of those are known as closure motions, a motion that the question we now put is such a motion. It has to meet certain criteria, as I just explained, moved by a member who has not spoken in the debate, it must be seconded, which it has been, and it can only be moved at the end of a speech by another member, which it has been, and it must be moved without comment, hence the other reason why you couldn't move it. Uh, and all political groups must have had the chance to speak, and then finally, in the Mayor's opinion, that there has been sufficient debate on the item. So, Mr Mayor, if you think there has been sufficient debate... I believe we have actually had sufficient debate on this, so I'm happy Thank to Thank you, Mr Mayor. In which case, we move immediately to the vote on the motion that the question be now put. It is done without comment, so there's no debate on this motion. It has to go straight to the vote, according to the standing orders. Sorry, Mr Mayor, point of clarification. Do I get, uh, as we move... Sorry, if the vote is carried, the move of the motion then gets the right of response before the vote is taken on the motion. But we now move immediately to the vote... This is on whether the question be now put. So you're voting in favour of that or against that. OK, so you'll follow what's happening. We're voting on the, to stop the further debate on this motion. All those in favour? And against? 
That's carried. Mr. Mayor, so Councillor Curling has the right of response uh, as a move of the motion normally would, and then we vote on the motion. Councillor Curling, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think we had many more, if any, more speakers anyway. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm saddened, but um, sadly not surprised that, uh, that this motion is being uh, rejected. Um, Councillor Mills mentioned that this is not the place to be debating national issues, and um, that I think that was the very point that I made some time ago when they were debating uh, the merits of having a uh, second runway at Gatwick Airport, which has nothing to do with this chamber. So uh, the hypocrisy is um, quite alarming. Um, also, some of the student debates, I mean, this isn't a student, student debate in chamber, I agree, but some of the uh, debates that I've witnessed in student debating chambers is far more mature and far more civilised than some of the nine comments we get from that side of the chamber. But perhaps they should go along and uh, observe how it's really done. Um, all, all I can say is, well, if we're putting residents first, perhaps uh, some of our residents are the first forgotten by this, uh, by this council. And perhaps the... Um, the refusal to, uh, to, to, to support this motion is a reflection of the fact that uh, the administration is all male, um, all male, all white, um, all middle class, uh, perhaps what some might call male, pale and stale. Um, so, Mr Mayor, just to clarify, I'm referring to the actual cabinet members, the cabinet portfolio members. Um, so there's not a great deal more I can say, is that uh, I, am, I am extremely disappointed that um, 12,000 women in this borough are being uh, let down by this council. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Curling. We now go to the vote of the motion. Those in favour, please. And against, that motion fails. Councillors, the, that concludes tonight's meeting. Thank you very much.